Welcome everyone. My name is Corinne and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Timothy Bisga as our speaker tonight, as he will be sharing his lessons learned from the most challenging and unique crown and bridge restoration that he has encountered after more than a decade in private practice. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it into the box labeled have a question and we will answer them live at the end. Additionally, Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Premier Dental. Dr. Bisga, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it on over to you. Thank you so much. It is a joy to be here with all of you this evening. If you're like me, you probably are wrapping up a day at the office, a fulfilling day nonetheless. And this is a perfect time to pull up a cozy chair, grab your favorite frosty beverage, and enjoy tonight's lively discussion on when optimal is not the option. And in case you were wondering, my favorite frosty beverage is a lemonade iced tea, otherwise known as an Arnold Palmer. Occasionally, I make it a John Daly. And if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And I'll leave it at that. So without further ado, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping for all of you. And that is that some of you would like to have the notes. And I can relate. And so I make them available on my website, toothlectures.com. If you were to go there now, they're available and you could follow along, but certainly they'll be there for your download should you want to go and review any of the information that we discuss. So I always think it's important that you sort of know who you're listening to and what my background is, and I'll be brief. And to begin is where I'm um, sort of my background or some things that I do related to the academic world. I attended University of Michigan School of Dentistry. I'm also an adjunct professor there. And I also have a special adjunct professorship at Creighton Dental School as well. And so I'm very much in tune with what students are up against, what they're learning. I see common things all the time. And of course, as was mentioned, I've been in private practice for 16 years, and my practice is in Cleveland, Ohio, and I ended up going back there because my dear old father started a practice some 50 years ago and it made it very convenient for me to step out of dental school and grab probably one of the best mentors that you could have, which is a parent, to be able to guide me through and show me some things. So that brought me back to Cleveland. And along the way, I started getting involved with wonderful organizations like the Dental Advisor doing product testing. And so I love products. I love testing. I love the idea of all the new innovations that we have available. And along the way, I gathered that doing dentistry eventually got easier, but it was the leadership skills and the people skills that I still needed and was lacking. And so I got some certifications along the way that I'm proud of. I'm a behavioral studies expert uh, in the DISC model of human behavior. And I've also done some leadership training under John Maxwell. And last but not least, uh, I'm also involved, is a, I'm passionate about education in one of the largest uh, private practice networks in the country. Smile Source, I happen to be their director of education. And so education to me is important, as is the protection of private practice dentistry. And along the way, my dad had a big influence and he shaped my career. And I tease and, and jest that I'm the triple threat or I'm trilingual. And that is that when I showed interest, he got me working in a dental lab. And I did that during my college years. I also worked part-time as a dental assistant. And then eventually I went on and became the dentist. So I have pretty much done all the jobs and looked at dentistry from many different points of view and more many different hats along the way. And it it's given me a unique perspective. And my promise to you is that I'm going to try to bring that perspective 
um, to tonight's lecture because really all three of those roles that I was in from lab technician to assistant to dentist, those are all critical in what we're going to be describing tonight. And that is this, at least the beginning parts of this single unit crown procedure and some of the mishaps that sort of happen or the common challenges that we see. And what's interesting about crown and bridge is this, it's these little vignettes of procedures that make up a totality. So we have the prep design, we have the provisional, we have an impression, we have a uh, temporary crown and cementation process that influences and of course, the final cementation. And of course, in between, we have to choose also the material that's going to best suit the patient that we have in the chair. And the place that I want to start with tonight that I see as a common challenge still has to do with prep design. Uh, things, the waters, if you will, have gotten muddier as we've continued to introduce into the marketplace new materials, right? So when you look back historically, we used to have gold and PFM. And if you look to the photo that's here, the red outline would reflect a gold preparation. The black outline would be a porcelain fused to metal. And then the blue outline would be an all ceramic type preparation or what is required in reduction to be able to give the lab what it needs to be able to prepare you a long-term fitting restoration. So as we continue to add new materials, going from just having one, now two, three, you have all these variations. What can I do with zirconia that I can't do with something like lithium disilicate? And so it starts to add the confusion. And what you end up getting is sort of Franken preps. This is the way I would describe it. Um, borrowing from the character Frankenstein, these Franken preps sort of have portions that resemble a ceramic prep design and some that look like gold and and others that resemble porcelain fused to metal. And what you end up having is something that's more challenging to work with and can lead to mishaps throughout the procedure. And so what I want us to focus in tonight are two key areas of the prep. And that first area would be to consider the height when you're you're done doing your preparation, or I should rather say what is left after when you're considering prep height, and then also the convergence of paralleling walls. And that is more importantly, your mesial and your distal walls, because those play a large role in retention and resistance formers we're going to discuss shortly here. So let's take a prep that you would commonly see, such as this, right? First molar, lower first molar, and just taking a look at it, all things aside, my question to you would be sitting here, would you consider this preparation optimal? Meaning that it fits the requirements for the restoration that you've chosen, that when you put on on a dry fit, your crown fits, it can't tip off easily, and therefore, you know, the cement's really going to hold it on and seal those gaps at the margin to prevent micro leakage, right? That's what we're trying to achieve. I would say yes. So this is what I would consider optimal. But you can see what happens when our prep, let's say we have a tight inner occlusal arch space and we have to do a little more reduction to be able to get that two millimeters perhaps that the lab is asking. And now our prep design looks like this. Would you consider this still optimal? And even more so, let's say you have a patient that you're working on and they have difficulty opening. And it's really difficult to get your burr in there and angle things. And they need to stop periodically, in fact, frequently, so that they don't feel like they're drowning. And you feel like all you're doing is watching the clock because you're not getting anything done. And at the end of it, you have something that maybe resembles this or or whatnot. And I would say, would you consider this optimal or would you look at this as less than optimal, right? Keeping in mind, and I put up the field goal post here, is that I remember when I was in preclinic and I was learning prep design and form on those lovely ivory dental teeth that we still use to this day, 
they were teaching us to try to make walls of our prep design, particularly the mesial and the distal walls as we were slicing through with our burrs to be as parallel like field goal posts as possible to try to get them as straight up and down. In fact, they would bring around a sharpened number two pencil. And the reason they would do that is because a very fine sharpened number two pencil is actually seven degrees of taper, which is hearkening back to the gold era where cements weren't very strong. And so we required our dentists to make prep designs that resembled field goal posts. And that's still taught today. It's it's always important that we learn how to crawl before we walk. And that is learn sort of all the rules and principles as we graduate into more relaxed rules, which today, if you look at the majority of preparations that are in a lab that are quote unquote considered optimal, they fall somewhere between 10 and 22 degrees to be considered ideal. And yet we are training students to try to prep and and have a target of seven to 10 degrees, like that sharpened pencil. So I, I like that because it's trying to get them to focus in, understanding that the uh, margin for error is much wider than seven to 10 degrees. We actually have a buffer of eight, up to 22 degrees for our converging walls. But those are just things to keep in mind. And so then when you take that, you've done your preparation and you, you have what you have, what is the minimum occlusal prep height remaining? that's going to retain your crown? And the answer is, and this is a board question, a great review for those who might be still in school, three millimeters on all teeth with the exception of molars. Molars being that in their position and their size in the arch, they require a bit more. They require four millimeters of total prep height after reduction to be able to adequately retain a crown. And my question to you would be to think into the last crown prep you did on a first or second molar. And after you had done all your design and you'd done your reduction, how many of you would say that you had four millimeters of occlusal height still remaining on your molar? Not many can tell you there aren't many unless they're periodontally involved teeth or what we call long in the teeth. And that is because molars, as we make those those reductions, one and a half to two millimeters to fulfill lab requirements for the material choice, we end up usually falling shy of that four millimeter mark. And so that leaves us with many, many molars on average, I would say the statistics say something like 46 to 50% of molars are inadequate to retain. Uh, the prep designs are inadequate on molars to retain the crown that is being prescribed for them. So then the question becomes, what do I do? Okay, Tim, we're friends, we're colleagues. I have run into a challenge. Either my prep is gotten short because I've run out of two structure or my walls have gotten a bit tipped in because of, you know, access or difficulty seeing and visualizing or just the burr that I chose at the particular time. It's lovely to have options like short shank burrs, like Premier offers. So that in those tight spaces, when you're working back on a second molar, you can simply slide one of those shorter shank burrs in and you can continue your preparation. But even in those cases, sometimes you have challenges, right? And you realize in looking and and doing an inspection of your prep, you've fallen short of some of the parameters to make it ideal. So how do you bail out? How do you get out of this? Well, there is a workaround, thank goodness, and it's been studied. And in the Journal of Prosthodontic Dentistry, 2004, volume 91, look up, a lovely little study that was done. You can see that if you focus your attention to the cervical 
one third of the preparation design. That is the closest to the gingival margin area. And you do your best to stand those areas up and get them back into that eight to 20 degree range that I mentioned earlier for your converging walls. You will fix all the inadequacies, but I am a picture person. So rather than just give you words, let me give you an example. This may be a, a crown that you inherited and it keeps coming out continually and you've been kind and you re-cement it on occasion. It might come out every couple of years and they bite into a caramel apple or something like this. And you, you say to them over and over, okay, we'll re-cement it, we'll get the Gorilla Glue. And then finally, the patient says, is there anything that we can do? Well, obviously, the reason that the crown keeps coming out has to do with the converging walls. If you look, this looks like an upside down pyramid or a TP prep, as my father calls them. And it's very triangular in shape. The mesial and distal walls are very converging. And that means there's inadequacies with this in terms of resistance and retention form. And so the way that you can fix this problem is, again, going to the research, is focus your attention to standing up the walls just in the gingival area, not taking any more off, just standing your burr around and walking it, making very crisp margins and converting your prep to this. Suddenly, you've now fixed all of the inadequacies with the prep. You can go ahead and order your crown as prescribed for whatever uh, you feel is best for the clinical situation. Now you can cement that and you can feel confident that because your prep is what's retaining the crown and you may have chosen a wonderful resin cement or a glass ionomer cement to help retain that, and those are very good and robust, now you can ensure that this isn't a phenomenon that this re-cement is going to happen every couple of years. In fact, it likely will not happen again. And that is a feel-good feeling because you've corrected a problem. And so looking ahead and, and thinking about prep design, I think it's good to follow some sort of sequence, right? Because sequence and routine, if you've ever read Tungarande's man checklist manifesto, he was a hospital administrator who decreased OR deaths and nosocomial infections by introducing checklists into his procedural. And that is that when nurses and doctors now exit ERs, and this has become standard practice, they count the number of sponges, the number of hemostats, pickups, all those things are accounted one in, one out mentality. And that way you don't end up having issues, especially um, in those situations. So it's good to have checklists for us. And in this case, I follow a checklist. This is just mine that I like to share. And for me, the beginning of crowns always begins with a buccal lingual reduction. The reason I like starting with this is that it helps narrow the isthmus for interproximal breaking, right? So now that I have gone and done the reduction on the buccal lingual, you can see I just have to break through on the mesial and distal that small amount rather than have that large gross chunk there. And that helps me visualize a lot better, especially when you're trying to keep your walls as parallel as possible. At which point then I do break contact and I then reduce the occlusion so that you get it to the particular height that you're hoping for. And then I always consider adding something like secondary retention slots or grooves. And in this case, I've added a mesial slot. So one of my pro tips that I like to share is when you've got to this point, you've kind of done about 95, 90% of the prep, and it's, it's pretty good. This is the point at which I like to turn the water uh, off feature on your rheostat if you're using air driven and even better if you're using electric torque hand pieces because now you can turn the speed really low and in fact you can even hit the reverse um, setting I happen to have electric hand pieces so I get to enjoy this 
And one of the things that I love about using two stripe burrs is that two stripe burrs, when you start comparing many different burrs that are out there, and there's some great single use burrs and some multi use burrs, but the way they do their construction with how they electroplate the diamonds, you'll notice on less expensive or what I would consider um, more value type burrs, you're going to see that the diamonds on the tip of the burr break off quite easily. And it is that very area that you really need to have good cohesion with those diamonds so that you can really crisp your margins. There's nothing worse than dull tipped diamond burrs and trying to really create beautiful, crisp, clean, readable margins for your lab. So great tip for me is once you're like 95% of the way there and you're not worried, you're not really taking a bunch of tooth structure, you're really just trying to bring out the finer detail. I like to turn the water off. And again, electrics, you can turn and dial the speed with a rheostat or air driven system. You can pump the rheostat. And I like to go around and crisp those margins up. It's one of those pro tips, really helps you dial in and get that nice readable margin for your lab. I wanna come back to when I showed the picture of my prep design with a secondary retention. Why do I consider secondary retention even on a tooth like a premolar? Well, it goes back to the literature, these important classes and things that we learned during our dental school and even beyond, what really causes our crowns to dislodge? Well, we don't chew like alligators. If you watch Animal Planet or any of those things, I have four children and we love watching, you know, the different shows and learning a thing or two and kids enjoy seeing the wild animals. We don't chew like crocodiles or alligators. We don't open and close straight up and down in, in an arc like that we chew more similarly to cows and the way they chew their cud. That is teardrop pattern. It's a circular motion. It's the movement of the condyle around the articular eminence and the particular anatomy of someone's cranial base. And it creates a pattern that's similar to a teardrop in shape. And it is that effect of chewing in a teardrop pattern that actually creates these little force vectors. Now, I used to complain about why did I have to take physics to become a dentist? And it is until you really start becoming the dentist and looking back, and isn't that true? Hindsight really is 2020. The reason we need to understand physics is physics destroys our dentistry. The jaw is a class three lever. It rolls, pitches, and yaws. It moves around and when that teardrop pattern of chewing, it is the sideways bending forces that we put on our posterior teeth and crowns that create little circular force vectors that cause dislodgement of our crowns. It's not a straight up and down. It's actually a sideways bending force. And so when you take a look at a prep like this, the less than optimal option, right, where it's already too short, and those walls don't look like field goal posts or rugby posts, if you will, or, you know, wherever. Um, you've got this converging walls and it is those mesium distal walls that are resisting those forces pushing. And so when you have that type of preparation, you can understand from a physics standpoint how occlusal stresses on a prep design like this that's not as robust is going to lead to issues or dislodgement. Fortunately for us, there is a solution. Again, going back to the literature, it has to do with putting grooves and slots, but it's where you put them that makes them count. So if we know that lateral forces of mastication and parafunction are what cause crowns to dislodge. And we know that it is the resistance form that is the design feature that is the determining factor in dislodgement. Then the best place to beef up resistance form is by placing your proximal grooves and slots in 
the mesial and distal locations to best resist the facial lingual forces. You may place groups, because this is a common question I often get when I present this type of information. People say, well, I like to put a slot in the buccal or the lingual, and does that still work? And the answer is yes, it does. But Woosley in 1978, he showed that the buccal and lingual only provide partial resistance because that is the location that the force for dislodgement is coming from. So the best place to put it is in the bracing in the mesial and distal so that it acts more like a brace rather than just giving that partial. It does help. It's better than nothing, but um, it's not as effective. The next common thing that I would say plagues crown and bridge when it's not optimal or where you see things beginning to give trouble or repeat visits. Um, I've mentioned number one was prep design for me. Design flaws and features that we either step over, um, we're in a hurry, or there's a clinical situation that sort of makes it frustrating or difficult to achieve. The next area I would say has to do with visualization of your prep. And that is comes from retraction. Whether you're using cord or I, I like to use paste like Traxident, um, it's very important whether you're doing a conventional impression or you're taking images using digital scanners, you need to be able to visualize and see because we're not at the point yet. And I'm not saying that in the future, this won't be something that I may see in my career and lifetime, as well as you, scanners with an ability to read through blood and soft tissue. But to my knowledge, those are just things that are being developed or looked at, but haven't been perfected, nor are they available for our use in the clinical space. So currently, we have to think about ways to be able to clean our field, to allow either an impression material or a digital image to be taken that's clean, crisp, and readable for our lab technicians to be able to go ahead and fabricate. So lots of ways to be able to control bleeding, certainly, from cord to using lasers to using paste. My preference is to use tracks, and that's tried and true, works great. But Fairness and balance, I always like to let people know there's a lot of choice out there. Many companies are looking to have some sort of variation that I've included here for review um, at a later time for you to go back and look at, you know, comparison charts, what they're using, what are different agents, and, you know, comments about it. But for me, it's it's been for a long, long time using Traxin because it's aluminum chloride at a 15%. That's a good amount. So you're going to get bleeding that stops typically between 60 and 90 seconds um, on contact, which is great. What I've always liked about it is it has a little bit of a clay-like feature to it that absorbs fluid, slightly expands, and that helps compress the tissue and sort of push it away and dries. And that's how you get really good cl clinical images like I'm, I've taken. Um, that you can you can show in a presentation and also translate that to a really nice, effective impression or scan, which most of my single units are I'm still I'm using scanning these days. Um, but whether you're using you know analog or digital, it doesn't matter. You have to have a clean visual field. And that way you're able to capture the information. In this case, we had used some conventional impressioning. And we were able to capture and see all the details and send it because we had a clean field. And so that's challenge number two with solution. That is, we have lots of choice out there. Um, the important thing is that you mind it and, you, and it matters that even if the material or the scanners is as good as they've got, we still have to do our part to provide a clean, visible field for us. Now. The final area that I feel is 
a challenge to less than optimal results when it comes to our crown and bridge. We've mentioned, again, prep design flaws or sort of features that we sometimes overlook. We've now reviewed and given you some suggestions. Then the retracting or capturing of the marginal detail, I've suggested turn off your rheostat, crisp those margins with a little waterless finish to those margins, and then make sure you get a good, clean, readable field by using a retraction quarter paste, um, such as Traxinet, which is my preferred and favorite to use. The third area I'm gonna touch upon has to do with temporaries. And temporaries are, are one of those things where I was taught there's several functions to our temporaries. First and foremost, they help us maintain static contact, right? We've done a crown preparation. We need to hold the tooth in its equilibrium until we deliver um, our final restoration. It's to keep the tooth calm. If the tooth has been through um, this and it's not endodontically treated, that is going to provide a thermal break and to keep the tooth from having sensitivity. Also keeps the bacteria out, right? Keep the tooth calm, keep it in a healthy state. Third function we see with temporaries are, of course, to maintain occlusion. One of the fascinating things about teeth is their continuous eruptive potential or their ability to move. If you move them out of equilibrium, things will begin to shift. And we're not talking big movements, but enough that if you have a temporary that's been displaced for a week and you go to seat your final restoration, you may have trouble getting it to seat. Um, in approximately the context may be too tight. And these are the, the constant reminders of how important it is that we make a good functioning temporary and we design it to maintain the occlusion and static contact. The last and, and again, helpful use of temporaries is they're great for trial occlusal vertical dimension. So if you're getting into the realm of doing larger cases, you're doing um, arch rehabilitations, full mouth rehabilitations. Temporaries are a great way to be able to test and try out opening up vertical and whether or not your new teeth will be able to function well for that patient in their current system. So what are we looking for in temporaries? We want them to create minimal inflammation. We would rather have them not be impinging on the tissue than have them overextended because if we go and we make that error in the temporary, it's going to affect us in the final cementation because bloody gums aren't good for cementing any crown. Even though the cements that we have available today are most of them moisture tolerant, very forgiving, which is wonderful that Manufacturers are continuing to push the envelope to make dentistry easier for us to provide. We still have to do certain things to maintain um, good, healthy gums, such as not overextending our temporaries to keep the inflammation at a low. In my practice, I have two temporary cements that I'm using primarily. Um, Temp Grip which is a non-zinc oxide, a zinc oxide non-eugenol formulation. And then I have Next Temp, which is a resin cement, more like I describe it almost like an epoxy type material, but it is a resin-based paste paste. And this is what I use for long-term temporization when I'm working on some cases where um, they're going to be in temporaries for a while and you know, there's going to be a period of time that they're going to be evaluated, like I said, for occlusal vertical dimension and whatnot. Or if I have a stubborn temporary that has come out and we're working on something else in the interim and they have to be in it, uh, great solutions for that. And so we have lots of choice, though, with provisional cements. We have the resin base, like Next Temp or Temp Bond Clear. 
We have zinc oxide eugenols, which are, um, you know, they have that clove oil smell and whatnot, but it become less fashionable today as we continue to use more and more resin cements for cementing our ceramic and our zirconia restorations. So learning that there is a potential for having some of that clove oil be an inhibitor of the resin bond, or at least lowering some of the bond strengths, that's debatable. There's the non-eugenol forms, which of course work excellent just as well, as I mentioned, temp grip. And then some um, old school people like to use Duralon, which Duralon was the cement that when it came out was really one of the stickiest and toughest stuff. And there are some people that are advocating when you cut that with some Vaseline, that's a great temporary cement for long-term provisionals. Um, but the idea of our provisionals is that we want them to stay in. And I always am fascinated by the numbers. The business of dentistry is one of the areas we don't get enough of as students. And if after you get out in private practice, you're learning the cost of doing business. And one of the metrics that I find fascinating is the, you know, when a patient comes back to your practice and needs to have a temporary re-cemented in between your definitive restoration and, and the prep appointment, there is a loss of cost that is not billable to anybody. And Certainly, if you want to keep your patients for a long time, usually you don't bill the patient either. And that is, this is some, some numbers that have been run over the years, and it's on average, I bet this has gone up too with inflation. But the number used to be about $115 it costs your office every time a, a temporary needs to be re-cemented before the definitive appointment for the final crown. So that's that's a real number to kind of keep in mind, you know, that, you know, it's probably closer to $140 these days, maybe even $150. But every time you have to turn over a room and you have to put somebody in the chair and squeeze them into the schedule and bibs and cotton rolls and temp cement and tips and all the things that you do to make that procedure, you know, smooth and, and nice, um, Costs your office about 115. I I would think maybe nowadays it might even be upwards of 150 dollars. And so some good tips to kind of help us with with temp cements and temporaries in general that we need to review and just think about. That is always double bleed. Anything that's in a dual barrel, double syringe, double barrel syringe type thing, bleed the tip and bleed the syringe. Bleed them both. So. Bleed it out, put on a new tip, and then the very first amount that comes out of that tip, discard. That is the most inaccurate part of the mix. Um, I know we want to be, you know, non-wasteful, but if the set times are off or the material doesn't work or function with the same physical properties, um, you can usually blame that it's an inaccurate mix. And so this is just good tips for us to continue to practice and to think about. Trimming, polishing, adjusting. These are all things that can be done, you know, quickly to taste um, using different materials, different rag wheels, different polishers, um, all to make them nice and smooth and shiny. But as I mentioned, let's say you have that patient that is notorious for dislodging your temporaries, and they're out there. There's some people that, regardless of the wonderful instructions in the home care. Please do not floss this temporary. Please don't use your water pick for, you know, the two weeks or one week or three days or whatever your lead time between when you put a temporary in and when they're going to be coming back to get their definitive. People don't always follow instructions. Surprise, surprise. And so this is a great use for something like Next Temp, right? Some things to note that are different than your normal temporary cement. Do not desiccate the tooth before seeding this. You don't want to have it super dry, bone dry, um, a little bit of moisture, nothing um, pooling or whatnot. 
the way I would describe it was the way a sidewalk looks after a summer rain shower, right? Just some moisture on the tooth. And I would suggest not to fill as you normally would, but apply a thin layer. And then the last you know, bit, so the, this would be a normal filled crown, right? Where you blast and you fill the whole thing and you kind of smush it in. We don't want to do that with a next temp temporary. You want to make sure that you apply a very thin layer as they have in this picture here, right? And when they say a thin layer, they mean just put a thin bead at the gingival margin of the temporary. Just a 360 degree gingival bead, seat it down, and that'll be plenty to retain that crown. And in fact, in some cases, the only way that you can get the temporary off, you may have to get a, a burr and you might have to make a small incision and just crack the temporary off, which is quite easy to do with bisacrylic. And my last little suggestion for any temporary cement would be to consider antimicrobials, right? What do I mean is that I always like to clean my preparations before I put my definitive cement. I also do this before I put temporary cement down. This is a wonderful little product that I, I went and discovered in some reading and caught a webinar during COVID a couple of years ago. Um, it's called Fight Back. It's a quaternary ammonium silane, and it is a long-term disinfectant that has a host of uses. And I'll just leave it there. If you're interested in antimicrobials and clean tooth surfaces before bonding or cementation, take a look at this material. So some thoughts to sort of leave you with. I, I told you after reading Atun Garande's The Checklist Manifesto, I came up with some checklists for myself. I'm going to share this with you. And it's my thoughts on the crown process. When you're in a crown process, it's good to have thoughts on it. And the, the thoughts I have are, where am I working? Am I working in the anterior or the posterior? And will isolation be a factor for this particular patient? I, I think the gold standard is to always apply and use isolation for, you know, bonding. But certainly there are cases where it's just not practical or you're unable to do it for one reason or another. And so if isolation is a factor and therefore bonding isn't going to be the best choice, then I think about conventional cements and then I need to ensure my prep has a retentive design. And that's what I'm asking of you as my colleagues is to say, hey, look, if you know you're going to be working on a second molar that's basically underwater for 100% of the day and 100% of the time you're working on the patient, it's probably good for you to make sure you pay attention to the design of the prep, make it retentive so that you can cement it with a very moisture forgiving and tolerant cement. That just makes good sense and it'll make your life easier. The next question that I ask of myself is what material do I need to use for this patient? Is it on request? Do they want more strength? Is that what I think they need more of? Is more of an aesthetic case and I got to go for maximum looks or is it both? Do I have a patient that is not only eating their teeth, but I, I also have to make sure they're super lifelike and pretty. And so there's options out there. Thank goodness we live in one of the best times for materials and dentistry. We really have a lot of choice. Is it perfect? Do we have 100% of the answers? No, but we have a lot better ones than when I graduated 16 years ago. And certainly we have better ones than we even did just a few years ago. So that's a good thing to think about. And then the last is a reflective question of myself, which is, what is my prep design? Is my prep retentive and is it deficient in any way, right? So we, we look at this prep here in the picture and hopefully we can agree that this is optimal. This is adequate. This is going to make it where we can choose to either bond or cement and it's going to work. And the choice really becomes what are we able to do effectively with either two-hand or four-hand dentistry? And likely you can probably bond this, no problem, but you could certainly conventionally cement 
and you wouldn't have a problem, right? I think we can agree that with an optimal prep such as this, we would probably cement. And hopefully you understand the difference, what I mean between bond and cement. Bonding, implying we're going to use resin, it's moisture intolerant of a situation. So with resins, you're, you're not thinking about it being a lot of blood or saliva. You have good conditions, you have a good prep, and you're able to go ahead and even use adhesive if you so wish, or you can go with the self-etch variety. But what about this? What about if your prep is short? Let's say this patient is new to you and their crown's out, it's in their hand, and you look in the mouth, crown is clean, prep looks good, but it's short like this one. And you see there's an inefficiency and inadequacy, right? Well, my suggestion is, are you going to bond or cement? And ideally, when you have a short prep and there's an inadequacy, you want to go bond. Bond to give the extra oomph to be able to hold that crown in, provided, of course, provided you can supply isolation properly. But what happens if you get a prep that comes in like this, the less than optimal? Well, hopefully now you have some options, right? If this is the patient that's in your chair, you can offer them a reprep. And you have two choices. You can do a core buildup and ideally reprep that core down to get ideal. Or as the literature suggested, and I suggested to you, you can focus on the cervical one third of this prep. Stand those walls back up to that eight to 20 degree range that'll fall within that I optimal occlusal convergence. You could even add a mesial or a distal slot or groove. You could add all four, a buccal and lingual if you wanted, and make it fit like a keyway. Um, certainly, uh, if this was the option that you had that you could reprep it, that'd be great. What if the patient says, no, I don't want, I just paid for this. Just get the crown back in and get me on the road. Well, you're going to need a bond and you're probably going to say need to say some prayers, right? And mind the occlusion would be my, my third little tidbit because if you have a short squatty prep like this and the patient doesn't want to let you reprep and correct the inadequacies, you got to use resin cement and then you need to mine the occlusion. And that is make sure that you have no lateral excursive movements on that crown. Otherwise, they'll likely be back very soon and perhaps not as happy as they were the first time. So as we sort of detail, this is another chart, visual picture, if you will, kind of breaks things up by category as well as um, substrates that you might be cementing green red, yellow, we're using traffic lights, universal, right? Green means go, yellow means uh, caution, red means no go, right? So in this case, you have ideal preps, pretty much can use almost anything to cement, um, but you do have to be mindful of some of the material choices because some of the materials require certain cements to be able to get the strengths. If you have inadequate preps, Again, whether it's your preps, now you know how to correct them, or if you've inherited some and the patient just isn't ready to let you do the new crown, you have these choices. Non-retentive, you really have self-adhesive resins or traditionals to be able to remedy your problem. Now, my final thing, and I'm going to show you one case, and we're going to wrap up for questions. I used to teach these courses and think, you know, like you do big, you know, beefy margins for the all ceramics. And I was using, you know, flat end tapered type burrs or shoulder type preps, but my feelings have changed. See, the beauty about dentistry as you age, and I've been doing this for 25 years, I've been in private practice for 16. And you start to see your work age. And the good part about watching your stuff age is you see what works and what doesn't. 
And so over time, I've gotten away from thicker axial reduction and leaned in towards these gingival curatage type burrs or that have these more sloped shoulders that I can create adequate margins. Now, I took a a course one time from the lovely uh, lecturer and wonderful dentist, Bob Winner. He works out at the Spear Institute. He's one of the, I think, only dentists, prosthodontists, and master dental technicians. He wears many, many hats, talented guy. And he stated, you give any lab technician that knows what they're doing, eight-tenths of a millimeter circumferential margin, and they can give you any restoration in dentistry, including a porcelain butt joint. And so it is possible to be conservative and still get the pretty ceramic stuff. So I've sort of switched my feelings to fall more in line with being conservative. And here's why. Case I did years ago, Emacs case, and it functioned great for about 13, 14 years. And then as teeth shift and wear happens, some excursive forces got high on the central incisor and she called me up and said, my tooth's out, except it really wasn't out. It was horizontally snapped at the gum line, right? So the way that I I figured this and how to fix it, and this is, a, I could get into many details, but safe to say was I wanted to preserve the original crown. There was no decay. This was just stresses got amped up on that tooth over time with wear and change. And she ended up snapping the tooth at the gum line. And in looking at it in retrospect, and the way that I corrected this is I had to do an endo, we put a post, and then I cut the post, and then I troughed um, sort of a channel between the crown and that was still bonded to her tooth that snapped off. And then I basically dry fitted them together, make sure everything would go to place, and then etched and bonded and then used a nice resin cement called ZR-SEM from Premier to be able to reattach this tooth and put it back on. And what it got me thinking about was, well, why did that happen, right? And it got me thinking that it was my prep design probably contributed some. Of course, it's wear, it's 12 years old, right? The reason that that central snapped off was that I was had reduced the axial enough that it, it likely weakened it that when those forces went up, it finally gave out and it snapped. And we were able to, thank goodness, rescue it. But I think that wise people learn from the mistakes of others. And so I, I've dedicated and tried to, as I'm getting into this season of my career, is to share some of that with you of what didn't go great with me. Fortunately, I was able to get it rescued, but I want you to be mindful of your axial reduction moving forward. So my summary thoughts before I turn to question and answer period, and my my final pearls are this. Go for an eight-tenths of a millimeter margin or less. And what I would say is mind your axial reduction. Think about your prep design. The second portion I would say is Add mesial and distal boxes or slots for resistance form. You can do buccal and lingual, but again, um, it's important to get the maximum when you have these cases that are less than optimal. And the best place isn't the buccal lingual for the slots. It is the mesial and distal. Go for it and, and create crisp margins and couple that with utilizing hemostatic agents. You gotta find the ones that work for you, um, that continue to deliver results. And I've given you some suggestions on on how to crisp those margins, how to keep them, uh, your lab technicians happy by giving them good visualization by using products like Traxident. And my last little pearl and thought before we move into Q&A is keep the belt and suspenders approach mindset and mentality to your crown and bridge. And what is that? Well, we all can agree that a belt has pant holding ability. But just imagine if you were to wear a belt 
and to wear suspenders. And there's no doubt both a belt and a suspenders alone have pant holding ability to be able to keep those britches where they belong. But think of combining a belt and suspenders, the belt being your prep and the suspenders being the cement choice. You put the two together, you have a unbeatable combination for, for holding your crown and bridge restorations together. So this is where you can reach me beyond today. I have a Facebook page that you can go to. Again, my lecture notes are at toothlectures.com. You can go there now and download the PDF and review these at your pleasure. Um, email me at toothlectures at gmail.com. That's the best place to reach me. Should you have any questions that I'm unable to answer um, tonight. And I'm going to come back and look okay. at some question and answers. Thanks, Dr. Bisca. I really appreciate that. So let's open it up for the Q&A session. And just as a reminder, if you have a question, please enter it in the have a question widget on the right-hand side of your screen. So our first question is from Stuart, who asks, uh, what diamond do you use to make rubes for a single crown? What premier diamond numbers do you use for the entire prep? So two-part question there. Okay, so Premier uses a nomenclature that has to do with the lengths of their burrs. And so I'm not going to even give you the numbers because I don't have the catalog in front of me. But I can tell you general shapes. So I have gotten into using the gingival curatage uh, burrs, which they have about three or four different shapes. And they're mostly flame like, but they have a, a sloped type shoulder. If you just ask any of your reps that comes in with a book, or if you go to even premieres and website and look up gingival curatage, I usually buy the gold plated ones, um, two stripers, gingival curatage. And I, I, I buy that shape and I use that to do my ceramic, all my, my zirconia, uh, nothing cuts like a two striper. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm using for, for burrs. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Deborah, who asks, would you put a M or a D retention groove if there is a M or D buildup? Yes, if you, so th this is a question that is speaking to along the lines of something that's controversial like proximal box elevation. So can you, I was taught in an era that said, hey, if you put a crown margin in a tooth, make sure it's in tooth structure, never in a restorative material. That was before and comes from an era before bonding got to a point that it's at today. And I would say I routinely will put a box or a slot into a restorative material that's bonded. And I've gotten my technique and my materials and my lineup to a point where I have faith and reliability in that. And so I have no problems suggesting that you put a retention slot or groove into a core material, provided that you know that you have a good bond between your tooth and the core. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from John, who asks, have you seen that the internal surface of zirconia crowns do not approximate slots and grooves as well as gold and PFMs? Can this be improved by the lab? Okay, so I am aware of that, and that has to do with the process. So the way that gold is made is a, a lost wax technique, mostly you know, or from that era where they were doing an investment, they would wax a coping, it would get cast, and it, there's nothing in terms of marginal fit. I know that manufacturers don't like this data to get out there, but you can't even compare the difference between a CAD CAM marginal fit 
and a pressed fit. So CAD cam that's being milled in a machine, good. Press fit with locks, lost wax technique and an investment, better in terms of fit. So that is correct that the intaglio of a zirconia that is milled, even if you add the slots, they can, they're going to build in what they call slop. And that is that when that burr is milling out that uncentered zirconia block and it's doing it, it, it doesn't create sharp 90 degree line angles. It softens them and rounds them up. There is some ability for the labs to tinker the tolerances, which you're asking them to play with when you're asking them for tighter fit. But my, I don't think to that level uh, and worry about it as much as make sure that on your lab slip, if you've taken the time to put a mesial or distal slot, that you make sure they don't completely block it out altogether. It's common for labs in a hurry to not, and I hate to say this is sort of ratting them out, but they don't read your lab script as thoroughly as you may be writing them. So if you are a detailed writer, and you like to write a lot of notes, I'm going to give you another pro tip. Don't. Instead, save yourself the hand cramp and merely write, call me. You will get a technician to call you, and then you can give them all the details that you want them to mind. If you expect them to read and highlight and go through all that um, with a fine tooth comb, I promise you, especially in today's day and era, with labor shortages and whatnot, that will be overlooked. And so the best way to ensure you get all of your design features added into your cases is merely right on your slip. Call me, and then when you're at work, go to the phone for the two to three minutes it takes to detail out what you're looking for. Great tip. All right, our next question comes from Nicole, who asks, which type of cement do you like for zirconia crowns? Mm. Again, it depends on where you're at and who you're working on. So I have a couple of cements that I use on the regular. ZR Sem, which is a premier designed self-etch resin cement, with a proprietary ingredient that makes it stick better to zirconia. And it's got one of the easiest cleanups. And I know people say easy cleanup, easy cleanup. When I say easy cleanup, it almost cleans itself up. That's how easy it is. And I really truly mean that. It's one of the most remarkable tack cures and peel phenomenons I've ever seen in the self edge resin cement. Um, so that's one that I use. I use GC's Fuji Evolve, which very easy to use, paste paste glass ionomer cement, more for moisture tolerant cases where I'm getting into a situation where I can't necessarily control the the tongue, the saliva flow. Maybe they um, they have a bleeding gums a little bit in that area. They didn't clean or do some of the pre rinsing and things that we were asking them to do in between um, visits. So I have a, an arsenal, but I, I really kind of keep it to, to those two for the most part. There's a few that may slide in there, here and there, but those are the two that are, are on the list the most. All right, our next question is from Maritza, who asks, do you prep your crowns chemically before cementation? I'm not sure I prep my crowns chemically i have to read how you yeah. how that was written do yeah. you prep your crowns chemically before cementation i i don't quite understand i'm going to try to interpret what i think the question's asking and that would be more do i disinfect and do i or Crowns can oh 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 cleaning the actual crown itself chemically. I air braid my crowns. 
So I don't clean. I, I in sometimes like if you're thinking like IvoClean with zirconia and cleaning salivary phosphates, I use air abrasion, 50 micron alumina oxide. I use a lovely little product called the Etchmaster, which is a chair side CAD unit, hooks up to your four hole hose connection, and it comes with single use patient tips. And I hold the crown over um, the garbage bin because it creates, you know, some of the alumina oxide dust. And I air abrade the intaglio of all my crowns, whether it's zirconia or PFM or gold. Um, the only one I don't air abrade is any all ceramics because air abrasion creates micro fractures in ceramic and porcelain. And then those I would rely on your porcelain etch and your silane treatment for chemically cleaning. So that's a broad question, uh, Maritza. Yes is the short answer. How I do it, it depends on the material. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Iman, who asks, would you remove existing buildup and place new core buildup or leave it when doing a crown prep? 100%. I like to own what's underneath my crowns. I know that flies in the face of some of the instructors who told you if that amalgam looks good, leave it. Um, I found that almost every amalgam that I remove, there's a little bit of decay. It might not be active, but there's usually a little bit underneath every one I've ever removed. And resins that are done by somebody else may not be done with the same level of care that I take. And so when somebody is coming in and if it even looks a little suspect and I know I didn't place it, yes, I will replace the core. All right. We do have a few uh, recurring questions. So I just want to make a note of them. Um, will we get a recording later? Yes, a recording will be sent out. Um, and then another question we've gotten is, um, what is that website that you mentioned for your notes? That would be toothlectures.com. That's the number two, the letters TH lectures, toothlectures.com. Thank you. All right. We have two more questions for tonight. Uh, Nicole asks, what do you think about, I might be mispronouncing this, Calibra Bioceramatic Bio Cement for Crowns? That's question number 13. Uh, promising research. Uh, stuff works in certain scenarios and I don't think it's a bad product. It's a glass ionomer backbone. So it's mainly a glass ionomer cement that has a unique formulation that upon setting the first 24 hours, it converts to a alkaline pH, which alkaline substrates in the mouth tend to produce crystals and crystals show have been shown to close the marginal gap on crowns so they have some pretty compelling research and i have used it and i have found it to be a good material all right thank you our last question is from michael uh, and Michael's wondering if you know offhand what the model number of the burr that was on the burr recommendation slide. Do you know that model number? I don't carry the model numbers. Sorry, I don't okay. have them. I have that catalog <laughs> like everybody else does. And I save the packets because they come in blister packs from Premier, the two stripers. And I just tell my assistant to reorder those. Um, when I'm out. So I apologize. I, I don't have that particular model. I just have the shape there. I use gingival curatage and they're the gold colored ones, two stripers. All right. They're gold plated, two stripers, gingival curatage. That's the best I can do to help point in the right direction. You should be able to find them on the page. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bisga. That wraps up our Q and A session. Wonderful. So, Thanks for having me. 
Of course. Thank you. Thank you for all the information that you shared with us. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight. We did record tonight's webinar and we'll be emailing the recording out sometime in the next week. So if you are interested in attending future webinars, you can also visit www.henryshinedental.com slash webinars. And lastly, we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks again, Dr. Bisca. Thank you.